topic of today's conversation is science and spirituality. Uh, my brother Dan here is uh, real excited to do this talk and I'm excited to hear it. So uh, with no further ado, do you got anything to say? I, I have further ado. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, a donation? Um, well, first of all, I just want to uh, invite you and thank you for being a part of our monthly series. This is a series we do every month. We might start to do it more often because it's so much fun, but we sing together, then eat together, and then learn together. So it's all about singing and learning and, and sharing and helping each other's growth in all sorts of ways. Are you ready, sir? Yeah, ready? yeah I'm ready. Oh, okay. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Like the rest of you, I didn't always believe what I believe today. So let's go back to my first understandings of the big questions like God. Understandings that I, I want to start with understandings I had before I knew about science. When I was five years old, I started going to Hebrew school. And I was taught about God and Jewish history. Now, when I think about it, it's actually surprising that my atheistic parents sent me to a reform synagogue and in that reform synagogue I picked up a devout belief in God. It's not supposed to happen with atheistic parents in a reform synagogue. There was no talk of God at home and reform Judaism is the least religious branch of Judaism. Nonetheless, I not only formed a belief in the God I was told about, I also formed a close, personal relationship with him. And him is the correct word, because even though it was never mentioned whether or not God has a penis, or if he does, what do we do with it? <laughs> the idea that he's, the idea that he's, that he's male was an unquestioned, an unquestioned aspect of the God I was told about. At home, I was not taught uh, formal education or notions about science. It wasn't like there was this religious notion in science. Rather, at home, we simply engaged in endless and painful battles and arguments about reality. Who did or didn't do what? Whose fault it was? Who was to blame? Who said or didn't say what? And it was very painful. The response to my father, who would punish me in some form every day, which usually included hitting, I developed a fierce commitment to fairness and justice concerning what was really going on and what should and shouldn't be done about it. This became central to my identity, a burning desire to know the truth and the reality and to rise above things that people said. Just because they said it doesn't make it true. I would often go to my room in considerable pain and turn to God. You, God, you know the truth. You know what happened? Crying, I would say to him. God would see to it that justice was done in the end. God knew that I was being honest and reasonable and fair, and that my father was not. When wrong, I admitted it to God and knew what really happened anyway. He was omniscient, so <laughs> there was no reason to hide anything. Reality, reason, and truth became the essence of my relationship to God, which I stand up. The omniscient one, whose reason and understanding were perfect. In our mutual understanding between me and God, in our shared commitment to truth and reason regarding God's creation and reality, I found refuge from early deep agony. Now hear me now, brother and sister. God is a concept really by you. which we measure our pain. basic scientific concepts in elementary schools, basic science and math, things that had a clear understanding to point to them. It was what someone believed or what someone said or what someone felt. You could point to them. You could show what the truth was. It was directly evident. Well, as you can imagine, this passion for truth and reason, my faith, if you will, 
in reality, inevitably would one day clash with my deeply comforting personal relationship with a loving, just, personal God. The first clash occurred in mid-elementary school. To understand the nature of this confrontation, you should know that I grew up on a dead-end street of 15 houses that were built shortly after World War II. The street was nearly all Jewish. And being a dead-end, there was no direct access to the rest of town. And because everybody who moved in there had baby boomers, or say, little baby boomers at the same age, you just had to walk out the front door to the sidewalk and there was someone to play with. There was really no need to leave the street. So from this little Jewish enclave, I started going to Hebrew school where everyone was Jewish. Surprise, surprise. So it was reasonable for me to assume that the world was more or less Jewish. I had no idea. I didn't know this until I grew up, that my parents wouldn't be shown houses in other parts of my town. And they wouldn't want to have lived in other parts of my town where we wouldn't have been wanted. Didn't know that. And I didn't know that our, my town was more than 95% Christian. It might have been like <coughs> or 99% Christian. At Hebrew school, where I first learned about God, my teachers wanted to teach me about Christianity too. See, it's very important to Jewish educators to prepare young Jews to go out in the world and face the fact that just about nobody is Jewish and so they can still hold on to their Jewish identity. Jewish ed educators are very uh, intent on maintaining the existence of Judaism. So I was taught that Jesus Christ, whom a group of people called Christian, whatever that was, believed in this person, Jesus Christ, whoever these Christians might be, because I never knew any of them, that Jesus was not only not the Son of God, but he was a mythical character who never existed. The proof that I was presented in Hebrew school of the non-existence of Jesus Christ seemed reasonable enough, and today I still am convinced that the flesh and blood man of the New Testament is largely myth. But that's another story, I won't go into that here. In any case, I went happily on my way, wondering about how people could believe something so silly. Then one day I was walking home from elementary school, into a public elementary school, and I'm walking home with a kid from the next block. That's the Christian section of town, right? And it's Christmas time, so we're putting up decorations in school. And by the way, we said the Lord's Prayer in the auditorium. It was the opening of the, of the show. It was always the Lord's Prayer. This is before they outlawed it. So I was beginning to realize that there are these Christians around. So I'm walking home with this kid, maybe we're eight, nine years old, and I say to him, you don't believe in Jesus, do you? I'm really thinking that, come on, nobody really believes in that. And he looked at me like I was pulling his leg. Like, ah, I'm pulling his leg. Are you, are you kidding? Of course I do. Don't you? What? Don't I? It's, is this a... And then it dawned on me. And I learned a lesson, but it wasn't the lesson that my Hebrew school teachers wanted me to know. The lesson I learned is that everybody believes what they're told when they're little. That <laughs> 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 was an eye-opener. And what I found out later is that for every belief system that people have, for every religious belief they have, there are more people in the world who think that belief is false than who believe that that belief is true. Mm. No matter what, even Christianity, because half the Christians believe that other Christians are crazy and are going to Hinduism, <laughs> and they make up less than a third of the population of the earth anyway. Mm -hmm. So, I came to the conclusion that there was no basis to any of these stories in reality. And it wasn't long after that that I began to learn that people would kill one another in large numbers over whose imaginary God was the best one. You know, at home the pain over injustice, things weren't true, the things were being done, and in the world people were doing things for crazy reasons. I turned away from that basis for belief and turned more and more towards the science, the evidence, the stuff you can see, touch, taste, feel, measure. But my personal relationship with God didn't die so easily. You see, while I had come to the conclusion that Judaism had no better claim to truth than Christianity or Islam, we all agreed that there's a God and there must be something beyond this life, beyond this moral reality. So with these convictions, my faith in God and in our personal relationship, it survived and grew.